Welcome to Philosophy for Living on Earth, coming to you live from the Ayn Rand Institute. This is a weekly webinar series exploring life's big questions and the answers to those questions coming from the ideas of Ayn Rand. I'm Ilan Jerno and I'm your host this week. And our big question for today is twofold. What is self-esteem? How do I get it? The format for these sessions is that I'll give a presentation of about 15 or 20 minutes and then I'll be joined by my colleague for a Q&A session and discussion. Today, uh, I'm joined by Ben Baer, who will be uh, joining us once we get into the Q&A. So by the end of today's webinar, you should come away with a better grasp of what self-esteem is and some leads on how it, to attain it. So I think most people agree that self-esteem is important. It's a, an important part of a good life. It's something people want, they really seek it. And you can see how important it is when you think about the people in your life or just your own experience. If you're gonna leap into a more demanding job or a promotion that you're seeking, or if you're gonna pursue some challenging goal in life, or you want a more fulfilling relationship, all of these things require self-esteem. If you're gonna go down new roads that you haven't gone down before, you need that kind of confidence. Self-esteem is critical to a good life. Now, I wanna put this from the other side of this. Uh, I wanna present it from the, the perspective of what happens if you don't. I think it makes a huge difference to your life, whether you have self-esteem or you lack it. So I think we all know someone um, who in, in some deep way really doubts themselves. So they, they, you can see how it eats away at them. It eats away at their ability to live and thrive. And not having self-esteem, you can observe this with people and maybe in your own life too, not having it or not having enough, um, it really holds you back from achieving goals and having a positive experience uh, in life and, and just having good relationships too. So let's explore what exactly is self-esteem and, and where does it come from? Or you can put this another way, uh, who can give it to you? It's something we all want, I think. Uh, and those of you who have joined today, presumably some of your motivation is you want to gain some self-esteem. You want to improve. And how do you get it? Who can give it to you? And one common view, and, I, and this is really pervasive, is that it's parents or teachers or people around you. Now, maybe this is part of your experience too. Um, one way people think of self-esteem is it's a big part of it is if your parents praise you, if they're really loving and supportive, you end up with one kind of picture of who you are and how you think of yourself. If they are not that supportive, you get a very different picture. And I think we, we, we can relate to that in our own lives. And there's variations of this, whether it's teachers or parents or friends and how they connect with you. I just want to share a quick personal story uh, because this definitely resonated with me. This, this is how I thought for a while about self-esteem. When I was a teenager, I was really sensitive to the need for self-esteem and I, I worked to figure it out. I, I gave it a lot of thought and experimentation. For a number of years, I thought that um, this is how to get it. I needed to get it from the kind of praise that my teachers would give me. And what I, what I discovered is that if I, if I did really well in school, if I got good comments from teachers on my papers, if I got good scores on it, my tests or my exams, my grades were high, if I was top of the class, if I could answer every question the teacher asked in, in a given class and raise my hand every time, I felt really good about myself. I felt positive. Now, so I did this for a while and I thought, okay, this is working. And then at a certain point I discovered just how fragile this positive self image was. Uh, and the, the trigger for this realization was um, I, I went from one school where I was doing really well and the teachers praised me a lot and I was, my scores were great. And it was going really well. I went to another school, different group of kids, different teachers. And in fact, just so happens, they were really smart kids, way smarter than I was. And I was nowhere near the top of the class. And it, 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 at that point, it didn't feel good. And in fact, um, at the previous school, I was in the, the most advanced class uh, in English class. And then when I went to the new school, I was actually put in a remedial class. It was that precipitous a decline. That, that's a true story. So it really underlined for me just how fragile and unstable it was to build a self-image this way based on sort of what people were giving me and, and sort of the praise I was seeking from teachers in particular. 
Now, I mean, there are variations on this. Not everyone is trying to do this through the praise of their teachers or their parents, but I think you can, you can see this as a common way in which people think about self-esteem. I just want to draw out what's central to this kind of view, and it's that it depends on other people uh, in how they treat you, and, in, and often in an example I gave, in the comparison between you and other people. So for me, it was I had to be the best student, and that obviously there has to be other people in the class against which you compare yourself. And, I, and as I said, this is a very fragile, not a stable way to, to form a self-image of yourself, uh, self-image. And the other thing that it struck me at the time was there's not a lot of control you have over it. If you end up in a class full of really smart kids or the teachers don't like you or something like that, then there's not much you can do about it. So I want to give you a, a very different view. And this is, I think, a fundamentally different perspective on self-esteem and how to attain it. And this comes from the philosophy of Ayn Rand uh, and things that, uh, a couple of observations that I've gained from reading her work. So for Ayn Rand, I, I said at the beginning, most people agree self-esteem is a good thing. But Ayn Rand goes even further than that. In, in her philosophy, self-esteem is a cardinal value. It means it's one of the top values you should be pursuing in life. So it's not just a nice to have, it's essential. And it's not, and she really underscores this, this is a life or death issue. It's as important as food and physical health. Just let that sink in. So she thinks self-esteem is that important. It's crucial to life. So how do you get at self-esteem in her view? So in answer to the question, who can give you self-esteem? What is Ayn Rand's answer to that? Only you can do it. Her view is that, and this is a key point I want to leave you with by the end of today, is that if you want to have self-esteem, it's, it's not a social issue. It's not about comparing yourself. It's not about what people do for you. It's about you. It's about what you can do in your own life. And you're the only one who can give you yourself self-esteem. So I want to break this down uh, and sort of unpack it for you so you get a, a better grip on what she's saying here. So let's start with... Uh, taking apart the view. So what is, in her view, yourself? Which is a very important part of this whole conception. And I think she has a distinctive view of what the self is. In her view, it's your mind. And she has a quote that I think really uh, captures this. It's, it's your mind, the faculty that perceives reality, that forms judgments, that chooses values. So if you think about in your own life, um, one way to put this is it's the self or your mind is your eye, the, not the eye that you look through, but the eye that chooses, that thinks, that, that thing within you that looks at the world and observes the facts and forms judgments and makes decisions and forms plans, comes up with ideas, reaches conclusions, and it's the thing that's omnipresent in your experience and that you are the one that you're seeing the world through that way. That's yourself, your mind, your eye. And I think if you, if you look internally, that's what you see. And we, we all experience that. Uh, I think it, it's, that's your eye, that's yourself, your mind in her view. So what do we mean by esteem? And as, uh, if you went to the dictionary, you would get that esteem is a positive estimate of yourself. So the question is, in Ayn Rand's conception, is what does it mean to have a positive view of yourself, of your mind? And it, here it's crucial to get what she's saying it, is it's not about you and other people. It's about or comparing yourself or what they give you. It's about you and reality, you and so your mind engaging with the world, engaging with the facts firsthand, you and the facts. You, in fact, if you, you can ask about this in the question period, um, you would need self-esteem on a desert island. I think it would be critical. Um, so no other people around you. Uh, so it's about you and the world and your ability to deal with the facts. So let's, um, one way she captures this is to say that self-esteem is reliance on one's power to think. And that's a quote, reliance on one's power to think. So let's flesh this out a bit more. Now, here's a quote that it could, it captures Ayn Rand's view of what it means to have self-esteem. And she says that it's, it's this certainty that your mind is competent to think and your person is worthy of happiness, which means worthy of living. So there are two elements here. There's your ability to deal with the world, to think. Your mind is competent to deal with the world. And the second is your worthiness. Let's take each of these in turn to say a few words about what is meant here. 
So the issue of am I able, is your mind competent? And the issue here is, as I said, it's you and the facts, you and using your mind to understand the world committed to facts and logic. It's crucial to get here though, that it's not about particular narrow concrete skills or knowledge in a particular area. It's not about I'm really good at biology, therefore I have self-esteem or math or tennis or any specific narrow thing because each of us is gonna have a different life experience, different interests, different kind of things that we wanna know about, different areas and, and, and abilities that we wanna develop. So it's particular to your experience, the things you wanna gain uh, mastery over. But the critical thing is your mind's ability to get the knowledge, get the skills, reach the right kind of judgments in those things that you're pursuing in all areas of your life, not just in one narrow area. Let me flesh this out a bit. So if you go back to the story I told about when I was in school and trying to get praise from teachers and, and uh, outdo other students, um, a better perspective, if you adopt sort of Ayn Rand's perspective here, is it's not about whether the, you're the best student relative to other students or even whether the teacher's praising you, because they, they often praised you, in my experience, they often praise me uh, more than I actually deserve. Uh, it's not about that. It's about, are you the kind of student? Are you engaged with the material? Are you, is your mind capable of learning the material? And the answer to that was yes. If you put in the effort, if you really try, if you bring a mind into focus, you can do it and you can master the material. And it's not just in English class, right? It's about your whole experience of life in every area. Are, are you the kind of person who can, if you put in the effort, can you gain the knowledge and skills you need to achieve the goals that you want in your, in your life across everything? So the crucial thing I want to stress here is this is a, a fundamental perspective on your ability, not a particular area of life that matters. So you don't have to be a great surgeon. You just need to be able to find a career and do well in it and know that you can gain the skills needed to advance and move forward. So are you, it's about gaining knowledge, understanding the world and you and the facts, right? You are alone against the world and trying to get your hands around it and find your way in there. And I, I just want to stress that, so, so the way Ayn Rand puts this is the standard for uh, is your mind capable, is it competent, is are you committed to an unbreached rationality? That's the phrase she uses. And I want to stress that what she's saying here is it's not about the degree of your intelligence. You don't have to be an Einstein to have self-esteem. And it's not about, um, it's just about how fully and relentlessly committed you are to using your mind and following the facts wherever they lead you. And again, it's not about the extent of your knowledge. You don't have to be the world's expert on some subject to gain self-esteem. It's what you need is to be committed to following the facts and, and using reason as an absolute. That's a phrase that comes up in her writing. So maybe a helpful way to think about this um, is, it's been put this way in some of the writings um, on Ayn Rand's theory. Self-esteem is a reputation you acquire with yourself. And if you think about how people gain reputation with other people, it's about their pattern of behavior across time and, and observed actions and decisions and choices. If you look internally and you think, what would it look like to have a reputation with myself? What that would mean is your pattern of behavior, the kind of judgments you make, the kind of conclusions you reach, the kind of efforts you put in, your ability to gain the knowledge you need. So are you actually using your mental um, resources to the fullest at every opportunity in every area of your life? If the answer is yes, and you will gain a sense of self-control over your life because you are in fact able to achieve the kind of things needed to get ahead in life. You're gaining the goals you want, you're understanding the world, you're able to guide your actions towards the goals you're seeking. So you'll gain a self-control and then you'll get a sense of um, confidence or efficacy. And efficacy is a helpful term because it means you're achieving the kind of goals you wanna achieve. And that's, that's a way to look at yourself and say, well, my, the reputation I have with myself is I'm able to do these things. My mind is in, engaged with the world in the right way. If you flip it over, if you're not that kind of person, if you're not con pulling your mind to the fullest and using your mind to relentlessly and committed to reason as an absolute, sometimes you drift along haphazardly or uh, you're not putting in the effort where it really is needed in your life, um, 
you avoid thinking about certain things because they make you uncomfortable. You shut things out. You, you block them out of mind. You pretend they're not there. If you do those things and they're habitual and you do them across time, that's not good for you. And what you'll find is you're not able to get the things that you're trying to achieve in life. You won't feel control of your life. And then consequently, you won't feel a sense of confidence in your mind's ability to gain knowledge and guide you in life. So there's kind of two, if you think about that as a pattern, the more you're engaged with the world, the more you're committed to facts and logic, the more you'll achieve the kind of goals in concrete areas of your life, the more you'll have a generalized sense of confidence and, and uh, self-esteem and, and that kind of uh, sense that your mind is capable of dealing with the world. I am that kind of person who can, uh, who can deal with uh, what I need to do. So let's turn to the other element of what self-esteem is about. So it's, it's sort of two related questions. Am I able? And we've talked about that. And then the second part of it is, am I worthy? And am I the kind of person who's worthy of the effort needed to achieve the goals that I want to do? So if you think living life means really engaging with the world, thinking, making decisions, planning long-term, um, gaining skills to uh, push yourself ahead in, in your career, making career changes, all kinds of things are required in your life. All of them presuppose that, yeah, you're worth making the effort to do that because you're going to be the one who benefits and you think yourself worthy of that. Now, here there's a really important issue that Ayn Rand uh, talks about. And I, I hope you'll explore some of it in the Q&A. Um, in her view, this issue of am I worthy is where a lot of people find a roadblock an obstacle or hindrance to self-esteem because the question, am I worthy, depends on uh, a view of right and wrong, a view of morality. And a lot of people in Ayn Rand's view, most people in fact, adopt views that are just floating around the culture. And there are views that are, that are in fact, they undercut self-esteem, they get in the way, they, they're destructive of self-esteem. So I wanted to just explore that for a moment. But let me say before we get to that, it's her view is that you can change that. That's in your control. So it's not a life sentence. Like if you adopted the wrong ideas, you'll never get self-esteem. That's not quite right, but let's explore this to, to see what she has in mind. So this is the obstacle I want to explore a bit. So as I said, if you, the question, am I worthy, really depends on what do you think, what are some assumptions you have or views you've accepted about a good life? And what does it look like to be a good person? And what a... Um, what are moral ideas that are sort of baked or that you've absorbed in your culture uh, and from parents, from schools, from if you go to church, if you go to synagogue, they're everywhere. They're sort of like part of the atmosphere. You, it's hard not to breathe them in. Um, so it's, it's more often the case that people have these views. And I think this is a really fascinating issue because it, it, it's one area where philosophy interconnects with, with uh, psychology. So, this is a, just sort of a sketch of Ayn Rand's view. I hope we can explore it a bit more in the Q&A. So because people have the view, which is to be moral means to, hurt, to help other people, to serve other people, um, do, do unto others rather than uh, to yourself, um, the, the implication of that is who are you to benefit? The, the good is to benefit other people, not yourself. Now, this is a conventional view of what is right, what it looks like to be a good person, is to give back to society, not to hold on to things to yourself, not to be the beneficiary. And what makes you a good person is you're doing things for the community, you're doing things for other people, and often very sacrificial. So he, that person is such a great person, he, he sacrifices for society. Those are some of the ways people think about these things. Now, often it's not held consciously in people's mind, but that's a view they've adopted. So what, when it comes to Am I, a worthy, am I worthy in the context of self-esteem? The answer they often get is, no. Who are you to benefit? Why should you take this effort? What's so, why are you so important? Shouldn't you be helping other people? So you could get, the, if you think about the two components of self-esteem, am I able? Many people are. Many people are, I think a lot of people just are really focused on the facts. They do well. They, they, they know how to navigate the world. They use their mind really uh, actively. But then in, when they think, when they reflect, am I worthy? Am I the kind of person who really deserves that promotion? Am I the kind of person who really deserves that more fulfilling relationship? Am I the kind of person who think of the value that you really want? Their answer is an unease. They're not really sure that they are that kind of person because they've been told relentlessly from every direction, no, you are not that important. What's important is to the extent that you serve other people, that you benefit them rather than yourself. 
So the result of this kind of thinking is that many people are torn emotionally and, and torn sort of psychologically and, and philosophically because they're, they're successful in many areas of their life, but they don't feel like the success is deserved. They, they're not sure, like the, the common thing that people experience is it's hard to take a compliment because they don't feel like, well, why should I be complimented for what I did? I mean, who am I? Why, why am I so important? And that's a dimension in which you can see people are, they have trouble accepting that they deserve the good things that they're able to achieve. So the crucial point I want to leave you with here is that this hinges on moral ideas and moral ideas that people accept often just sort of unwittingly or uh, passively, but that you can change. And this is a key point I want to draw uh, out, which is Ayn Rand's view is that you can rethink the moral ideas that you've come to accept that are in there and that affect your ability to have self-esteem. It's up to you. You can adopt better, more rational ideas about morality. And that's part of what Ayn Rand's morality is about, is giving you a, a rational view of how to guide your life and achieve values. And if you do that, then you're in the driver's seat and the road is wide open. It's really crucial to get that from Ayn Rand's perspective, both the elements of self-esteem, the question, am I able, is about how you use your mind. You have direct control over that, that you have the ability to activate your mind to the fullest or not. That's in your control. The second element, am I worthy? That's in your control. It's not as direct, but it's still up to you to decide, am I, is this right? Should I be on this premise that it's only good to serve other people? And what about me? Don't I deserve something? You can check that moral premise and adopt a better idea. And if you do that, you can clear the path for yourself to attain full self-esteem and really feel great about yourself and achieve, and achieve the, the goals you want in life and have a flourishing, wonderful kind of life. So both elements of self-esteem are in your control in her view. So let me just sum up some of the, the key points I, I've been sharing with you today. So the first one is, Contrary to common views, who can give you self-esteem? And Ayn Rand's view is not other people and not comparisons with them. Definitely not. Only you can do it. The second one is self-esteem means a certainty that your mind is competent to think and that your person is worthy of happiness. There's two elements that's really important to get and they're, they're really interconnected. It's hard to pull them apart. We do that, but it, it, you can think about them separately, but they really go together. And the third point that I wanted to stress is that both of the key elements uh, of self-esteem are within your control. It's up to you. You can change how you use your mind. You can be more committed to facts. You can take reason as an absolute, which is the way she thinks of it. And if you, if you find, and I think this is many people's experience, you're, you're on the premise of a moral premise that you, you don't feel worthy, um, you can question that. You can adopt better ideas and reorient your life towards a better path. So that's the, the presentation. I hope I've stimulated lots of questions. My, my hope was to be really provocative. Let me share with you a few suggested readings. I know many of you uh, perhaps have read one or more of Ayn Rand's novels. I, I hope you have. If you haven't and you're interested in self-esteem, you can read these books from, there's a lot in these books, but if you read them from the, the perspective of what is her view of self-esteem, what is her view of an individual, of personal identity, of the self, Anthem, that's a big focus in Anthem. Uh, the Foundhead is a really a, a deep uh, analysis of what it means to, to be an individual, to have confidence in your mind and to be committed to that. And Adler Shrugged is just a, a much an even richer analysis of self-esteem. And that's where a lot of her um, statements on self-esteem come in the first uh, instance. So definitely revisit those if you haven't or read them for the first time. Highly recommended. And further, if you want to read some of Ayn Rand's nonfiction, a couple of essays that there's a lot you could read, but I just picked a couple that you can find on our website. Uh, one is called The Metaphysical Versus the Man-Made and Selfishness Without a Self. The first one, I mean, both of these are really deep philosophical uh, essays. They're, they're accessible. They're, they're, not, they're, not, they're just challenging because they're going to make you think more deeply. Uh, and I really recommend them. One of them has a lot to say, metaphysical versus the man-made, has a lot to say about thinking about the standard that you apply to yourself and how you judge yourself and how to judge the world and using your mind and, and sort, of, sort of thinking about that, those kinds of issues that I raised. And Selfishness Without a Self talks about some of the things that happen for people who don't really, are not really committed to reason, what it, that looks like and the phenomenon of um, 
what people do when they don't achieve self-esteem. And I, she has a view of that as well, which is well worth exploring. Okay, so those are suggested readings. I, I wanna put a poll before you, um, before we get to the Q&A, because one of our goals of this webinar series is to introduce some of Ayn Rand's ideas to people who just aren't that familiar with what she has to say. So it's really helpful for us to know how much of Ayn Rand's views you, you've experienced. So I'm gonna put this poll and I'd love for you to give us your feedback on that. So while you're giving us your responses, um, I'm going to share with you a preview of next week. So uh, you'll meet Ben Baer in just a moment. And he will be here in the Q&A. So are you guys seeing the poll? I hope so. Any responses? Here we go. How familiar are you with Ayn Rand's ideas? So I'd love to get some of your responses to that. And while you're doing that, once you put in your, your response, uh, so next week, Ben will be here leading the webinar. And his big question is, can you take credit for who you are? And that's a, a really deep philosophical issue that implicates questions of who you are and also questions of what it means to take credit for things as issues of justice there, and also issues of, of free will, which is a big part of um, Ayn Rand's view. Okay, so we've got the poll. I'll leave that up for another uh, few seconds. As we do that, I want to invite you to tell us what big questions you'd like us to answer or to, to explore on these webinars. So if you have an idea, we'd love to hear from you. You can write to us at webinars at aynrand.org. We'd love to hear uh, your suggestions. All right, so we have had the poll. I think most people have responded. I'm getting, um, there's a few of you who haven't responded. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Um, I'll leave the poll up another 30 seconds or so and we'll get to that. Okay, so Ben, would you join me? Hi, there you are. Hi, Elon. Hi, Ben. So I'm gonna move us to the question period. And thanks everyone for uh, answering the poll. Uh, it's really helpful for us. I'm going to remove it now. Last chance. Okay, here it goes. Great. So Ben, why don't we turn to some questions from our uh, viewers? Sure thing. And I should, I should remind you to uh, unshare your screen pretty soon. Um, lots of interesting stuff and material, Elon, on a really important question, I think. I should remind those of you out there who uh, want to ask questions. The best way to do it is uh, to use the question module. If you, if you hover over your screen in Zoom, uh, then there'll be a button at the bottom that says Q&A, and there's a place to submit questions there. That's what I'll be checking. I haven't gotten that many of them yet. I did get a few during Elon's uh, talk. And I'm also checking out Facebook. There's a few things that have come up there, but I'm gonna look at the Zoom questions first. So, um, it, Elon, I thought I would start with a question that was relatively concrete and uh, I think that your your anecdote may be, uh, uh, well, some, some of your anecdotes may have related to it. There's an anonymous attendee who asked a question, I think when you were talking about how it's in your control. Um, how do you overcome constant parental criticism? I, I don't think that you had that, but um, it, maybe this person asking the question does, and maybe he's wondering uh, if it really is in your control, if you're, uh, what, how, do you, how do you control it if people are always criticizing you? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think it's something a lot of people experience. I actually did. I didn't want to share my own life experience, but uh, it wasn't constant, but definitely there was that. I just want to say one broad point before I get to the answer, which is, um, as I mentioned briefly, self-esteem is an issue in philosophy, but also an issue in, in psychology. And the focus of the answers I want to give are on the philosophical side, that's where I know something about the topic. There are a lot of things to say about self-esteem as a psychological phenomenon. That's not my expertise. I will, perhaps we'll have another session on that kind of issue. Uh, and then Ben has different uh, kind of expertise and he'll say uh, what he wants to talk about. But I, I just wanna make clear that I, I'm not here to speak as someone who's in the field of psychology. I'm here as someone who knows something I've studied a lot of Ayn Rand's ideas, and those are the, that's the perspective I want to take in answering these questions. So I, there are aspects of some of the questions I won't be able to address as a result of that. So on the question of overcoming constant criticism, 
I think it's difficult. And I think being a, uh, a child, and I don't know what age we're talking about, or a teenager, there's often a lot of friction in the household because part of being a teenager is figuring out who you are. And then often that means in contrast to parents and contrast to other people. And there's also the things that parents and, and kids do that irritate each other. Um, so one thing I would say is it's imp- one, actually one thing I experienced in, in this context was um, I would ask myself, is this true? Okay, maybe my, my mom or my dad is saying, you're a slob, you, you know, you, you're late, you should you take out the trash, whatever the concrete thing is. I would ask myself, is it true? I mean, am I really on the hook? Did I do something wrong? Or are they just being nasty? Are they, are they you know, taking out their aggression on me? And, I, and I, was, I was also actually bullied when I was a kid, and I had the same perspective, which was, um, that wasn't severe bullying, but it was, is this true? I mean, do I, do I really look like a frog? And it was really helpful to kind of get a perspective of, well, no, I don't really look like a frog. The person's just trying to push my buttons. And so one, one thing I found helpful is to really look at the facts and say, how should I judge this? Does this make any sense? Is, is, this, is this literal criticism that I should think about? Is this something I can grow here as a result of this? Or is this just somebody taking their, their aggression out on me or for whatever purpose? Um, and then that put me in a different mindset. And that not granted, this isn't it's not trivial to do, but sort of reorienting to what's really the fact at issue here. I found that really helpful, and I also find that helpful today when when I get criticism or feedback that I don't agree with or that it just irritates me or activates me emotionally. Just to think, well, okay, that's how I'm feeling. What, what's really at issue here? What what are the facts? Um, and, and I'll say one other thing about this, which is. Um, developing a self-esteem as you're growing in, into a teenager, into adult, it, it's its own kind of challenge. And it, I think it becomes, a, um, you get a, a better footing once you are an adult, I think. And some of the things I've been talking about are um, easier to kind of navigate when you're an adult rather than when you're a teenager. Do you want to add anything to that, to that Ben? No, I think that's most of what I would have said, though. I mean, I think it's important that I mean, when you're young, you, you do have to rely on your parents for a lot. And so it's difficult when you come to terms with the fact that they might not be right about everything. I mean, we start, we start to figure that out, I mean, depending on our level of intelligence, um, sometime in our teens. Uh, and sometimes people go too far and they say, oh, the parents are wrong about everything. Um, but I think what you're suggesting is, is no, you've got you've to be, try to be even handed and objective about this and uh, not just rebel uh, for the sake of rebellion, but think about what's the truth of the question at hand. You know, someone makes a criticism, is there anything to it? And if there is, it might be something, yeah, you can learn from. But if you don't think there is, then you can start to keep track of, well, how often is this person getting things right or not? Yeah, well, one other thought I would just to tack on to that, Bill, so I think if the context of the question is for someone who is now a teenager you know, growing up, one thing to keep in mind is this is not to excuse a parent who's just kind of cutting you down. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that um, it's hard to separate out the way something's presented and the facts of the matter. And, and often people will be really angry, but they have a point. <laughs> and the anger that they bring to it sort of gets in the way. And that, that's part of what makes it difficult to experience. So just think about that too. Here's another question from the other side of the same sort of situation uh, from Colleen, who's asking, how can we support self-esteem in our young children? So now from the perspective of a parent. Yeah, I have to say I'm a parent and this is something I'm working to figure out. I, I, I don't feel I have a total mastery of this. Uh, my view is, uh, um, let me think a couple of uh, things I could say that would, would be helpful. Um, I think it's really important to model for your children how to engage with the world. And if they see that you're really fact oriented, that is something they pick up on. And if you're asking them for evidence and in, in issues or disagreements, then they'll pick up on that and that'll be a really important foundation for them. Um, and I think the other one is to let them figure out what they're interested in and to really get invested in values that they're passionate about, whether it's a sport or something they like to read or some issue. I think having really strong sense of, personal values is critical to developing self-esteem. You have to have those. Um, so those are just two quick thoughts. I, 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 um, I, don't, I don't have a great deal to add on that. I think there's a, it's, a bit, it's a big field and um, perhaps it'll be a topic for another webinar. 
Well, here's a question that's uh, somewhat related in that I suspect uh, parents will often uh, come to have to come to terms with this kind of issue. Uh, and this is from Skyler who asks, what are the negative effects of participation awards on self-esteem? I assume he's talking here about the kind of awards where everybody gets one no matter how well they do. Yeah, I, I mean, my observation is, it, I mean, there's a wider issue here, but my observation is that at a certain point, it doesn't register with kids. It, you walk away with a trophy or an award from everything and it's just, well, it's, it's a given. It, it's not clear. They don't make the connection between the, the level of effort they've put in and the, what they've accomplished, if anything, and their awards. So the, it's, um, it, it dilutes any meaning that there might be in awards if, they're, if those are appropriate in the given uh, activity. Um, but the, the wider phenomenon, which you can see in this, and parents do this, which is, so, so one of the earlier questions was about parents who are really negative and constantly cutting down the, the, the kid. Um, you get the opposite kind of problem too, which is the parent who anything you do, or, or even the boss, anything you do is, it's great, it's wonderful, you're brilliant. And at some point, you, the kid realizes this is BS. <laughs> it's not true. I, I can see what I did. I saw my grades. I know how much effort I did or didn't put into this. And they, they, they lose, they, they kind of lose the appreciation for, no, there has to be some ca causal relationship between what you do and what you accomplish. And if, if there is some um, acknowledgement or praise of it, it has to be objective. And, and one of, it's actually damaging, I think, for, ki for some people to get constantly showered with that's a great thing good job good job and, and i think um particularly with kids because they are trying to figure out what does it take to do things and they're very sensitive to what adults tell them uh, and in the business setting i just think it's i don't know i haven't met a boss that's constantly showering people with praise but it, it, the problem there you can tell is it has to have a relationship with what the person's doing and if the boss isn't giving them objective accurate and timely feedback they're not doing what they should be doing i think the same principle should apply if you're dealing with kids or with grown-ups so the one thing i would add there i mean you mentioned that part of the problem is that kids will figure out that it's bs uh I, mean, I think that's true in the best cases of kids but i mean as someone who used to be a college professor i think i dealt in a lot of cases with 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 students who maybe didn't figure it out on their own and then they came smack up against the reality of a, of a professor who was going to give them, who's not always going to give them an A. And then one of the destructive consequences might be that, you know, they have a, they have a temper tantrum and they can't, they can't deal with, they can't deal with it when it becomes really obvious. Uh, and, you know, depending on who you talk to, you, we may, we may be seeing more and more of this on college campuses today uh, with the, uh, you know, concern about uh, trigger warnings and safe spaces and so forth. Uh, it's not quite clear to me how bad that is, but um, I saw I saw you know elements of it certainly when I was a when I was a professor. Um, and here's a question that maybe relates somewhat to that whole issue. Um, and it's uh, actually it comes from a comment that somebody wrote on Facebook, but I'll try to rephrase it as a as a question. Uh, Lon is basically asking, can't self-esteem sometimes be a negative? Uh, what about somebody like Stalin, he says, uh, where I assume the idea is that Stalin thinks very well of himself and does bad things because of it. Yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating question. There's a lot of, a lot of parts to that, so I'll, I'll try to take some of those. Maybe you, you can cover some others. Um, can there be too much self-esteem? That's one way to think of this. Or it, what, what does it look like when someone has so much that they end up, you know, presumably the, the premise is they end up like Stalin? I, I think... I don't think you can have too much self-esteem if you understand what it means. Um, it means, to reiterate from the presentation, it means your um, assessment of yourself, your fact-based assessment of yourself, that your mind is capable of dealing with the world, that you have, you're the kind of person who makes the right kind of judgments, who achieves the kind of knowledge that you need, and that you're worthy of attaining those ends. Now, you can't have too much of that because that just is a, do you have it or don't you have it? And you can, you can have, it can vary in terms of the level, but I don't think there's such a thing as too much of it. The phenomenon that people are naming, are pointing to when they say too much self-esteem is a, is a different phenomenon. Uh, I'm not a psychologist, but I think sometimes this is called narcissism. Um, but whether, whether that's the accurate term or not, but there's definitely people who, I mean, here, here's one characterization of it is 
they are really in your face about how good they are. They often, they like to brag, they like to boast, they humble brag. There's all kinds of ways in which they, they make an effort to really tell you how, how confident they are, how good they are. How, if that's the sort of thing we're talking about. Uh, I think in Ayn Rand's view, those people are actually betraying a lack of self-esteem because if you think of what that really means, it's they're telling you and maybe in the act of telling you, they'll convince you and, and convincing you will make them feel that they have it. Uh, and I met people like that. It's, it's, it's kind of disturbing because the, if you know that that's what they're doing, they know that's what they're doing. It doesn't really work. So I think that's a, a sham kind of self-esteem. It's not well-founded. And whether, leaving aside kind of the bragger type, the person who's really, um, who, who sometimes is described as having too much self-esteem, um, that kind of person is, is in a way demonstrating one way in co of coping with, that, uh, with the problem of not achieving self-esteem. And this is a category that Ayn Rand calls pseudo self-esteem. It's like you're trying to prove to people that you have it, whether it's by bragging or by doing things to show off or um, uh, being ostentatious about what you've got and, and, and sort of pushing into people's faces. So, I, I mean, there is a, such a thing as pseudo self-esteem, the fake kind and it, the very, various forms of it. Um, let me let me just say one thing about Stalin uh, and more generally people like him. Uh, I don't think the, the, it's accurate to characterize them as having self-esteem because while it's common for people to think of dictators as well, it's all about me. I think what, and this is part of, Ayn Rand has a really deep analysis of the psychology of this sort of person, um, this kind of the dictator mentality. I think what you find with those people is that it's, their lust for power over others, their, their, the desire to dominate and to rule a country, rule continents, take over the world, master everybody, which is essentially Stalin and, and many other people throughout history and people today. That actually is a reflection of a lack of self-esteem. It's, it's a real profound uncertainty and terror that they can't deal with the world. And the way in w one thing they do to deal with that is they figured out that, well, if I can control people, that will give me a sense of control over the world. Um, and, and that, I mean, it's false and it's hugely destructive. I mean, that shouldn't, that should go without saying. Um, so I, so, but the crucial thing is I don't think of them as people who've achieved self-esteem. I think of them as people who fail to achieve self-esteem. And in fact, they're driven not by reason or, or by fact, but, but, but their fears and their emotions. Um, I, I think a couple of things to read on this from Ayn Rand would be, I mean, the Fountainhead, the, the villain of the Fountainhead is a really interesting psychological, that's uh, character is Ellsworth Tuhi. I don't think I'm giving anything away by saying he's a villain um, or oh, main character, I guess. Uh, spoilers are already out. Uh, he's a really fascinating character who sort of gives you a sense of what that looks like. Um, and then I, in the nonfiction, I would say, um, I think I think Monument Builders is an interesting one on this. And then you can find other leads in, I mean, I should just say as a general resource for you guys, on our website, you can find the Ayn Rand lexicon, which is, it's sort of like a mini encyclopedia of Ayn Rand's views and, and, and excerpts from her writings organized thematically and, and alphabetically. And it's a brilliant thing if you just want to get, what was her view on this? And it can be a lead into reading a more substantive piece. So I'll, I'll stop there if you want to add anything, Ben. Well, one of the essays you already recommended in which I put the link to in the comments section, Selfishness Without a Self, deals a lot with this issue. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I would add to the, to the Stalin question, to the uh, discussion of the, the power lusters, uh, I mean, I think you did a really good job in your presentation explaining how, uh, how you know, folk, investing your self-esteem in other people's opinions is, uh, is so destructive to authentic self-esteem. And if you think about it, what's happening in the case of the power luster is really somebody who's just got that problem, but it's on steroids because they care so much about other people that they can't stand the fact that somebody is out there who disagrees with them and the only way to eliminate that annoyance is to destroy them and to wipe them out, uh, and, which is the ultimate form of you know, exercising power. And yeah, there's a lot about that in The Fountainhead. You see a lot of it in Atlas Shrugged too, especially uh, the character of Robert Stadler um, and James Taggart as well. Um, so let me uh, ask, a, uh, there's a couple of related questions um, which I'll, I'll give you both of them. Uh, and it has to do with, uh, I think, digging deeper into what self-esteem really is. 
uh, as opposed to some of these misunderstandings of it. Uh, so we have one question from Naveen who asks, is self-esteem something that you want to even focus on or do you want to just focus on reason, rationality and always using your mind to the fullest in every situation? And then another one from Emily, can you elaborate on reason and purpose and how they relate to gaining self-esteem? Yeah, so good questions. I would, so on the first one, I would say, yeah, your orientation in life should be to the facts and using your mind and achieving things. But um, one reason you might want to focus on self-esteem, and I think it's something that, um, let me put it a different way. Um, self-esteem is a huge value in life. I think that's something that needs to be appreciated. And um, my suggestion, so the takeaway from the, the lesson from the webinar is not spend every waking minute thinking about what's my level of self-esteem. Well, how do I, how do I do today on my, on the meter? Like if you just imagine if there's a meter that measures it, I'm not suggesting doing that. What I'm suggesting is conceptualizing what it is, thinking about it and, and, and understanding it deeply and then thinking, do I have self-esteem? Do I, do I have what I, what I want? Or are there ways in which I don't feel it's completely there? And if it isn't there, then do the work that would be good to do. So be more committed to the facts and to reason, rethink some of the moral assumptions that you have that might be roadblocks here. And there's more than I've said about roadblocks to self-esteem, but just think about it that way. And then I think it's good to, to recognize that self-esteem is not an, uh, an on and off switch. It's not like you just have it and it's there forever. It's something that you, because because as a living being, there are always new challenges, new things you need to learn, and new circumstances. And self-esteem is something that you you maintain. It's something I, that's how I think of it. And to do that, you you need to, if you find things that are pushing back against, like oh, I'm not sure I want to do that. Why am I not sure about it? So be introspective and think about: Is it? Are you resisting a step in your career for lack of self-esteem or are you resisting it for other factors? And it's important to sort that out. If it's a self-esteem question, maybe there's work to be done there. So I guess I'm saying it's a, it's a huge value. Think about it, understand it. If you find that you're not where you want to be, do some work to, to get there, but recognize that it's something to maintain through continual action that is positive in the right direction. So that's one way I would answer that. I'm, I've now forgotten the second part of the question. That one was about, uh, can you say more about the connection between reason and purpose and self-esteem? Yeah, okay. Um, my hunch is that the person asking that question maybe has read quite a bit of Ayn Rand's works because for Ayn Rand, the cardinal values are reason, purpose, and self-esteem. So the, the three things that are must-haves things that you want to cultivate. Not, so reason is both a thing you want to pursue and, and develop and, 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 um, and value, but also something that you use. It's your mind engaging with the world. And the same is pur with purpose and self-esteem. So I think they go together. And I think it, um, we've been focusing on self-esteem, but I, I think if you're zooming out a bit and seeing how they fit together, they're a unity in an important way. Because to get self-esteem, you need to use reason. And to, to and part of using reason is thinking about what was my purpose here? What am I trying to do? Uh, and so I, I, I think it's important to see that they go together. Uh, I think it's hard. I don't, I haven't thought about this before, but I don't see how you could gain one without the other two. It'd be probably a, a non-optimal situation if you're sort of deficient in one or two of the others. Did you no, want I to think to that, Ben? Yeah, I think it's, it's really important to get clear on the connection, especially between reason and self-esteem. Um, and for the reason that you emphasize, which is that, well, what is the self? When we talk about the self that we esteem, what is a self? And there's many things that could be it, it, that people have thought that it is. You know, is it just whatever you happen to desire at the moment? Is it your feelings? Is it your urges? Well, that's not really what a human self is. A human self, the thing about you that most makes you what you are is your mind, your rational mind. Uh, and that means, uh, that means your commitment to knowing what's true in the world to try to navigate your way through it. And I mean, you, you did mention, Elon, that there are ways in which people will default on a commitment to reason. They'll uh, come up against facts that they, uh, they think are unpleasant. They'll try to push them out of their mind. They won't try to pursue uh, answers to the questions they know are important. Um, and, you know, one thing that's, that's worth mentioning here, I think, is that uh, there's, 
there's a lot in our culture that encourages them to do that, uh, especially coming from uh, especially coming from uh, a major cultural force, which is religion. I mean, everybody knows that there's a question about how do how do reason and faith relate. And there are a lot of people who think they can kind of balance them and kind of compromise and say, well, I'll use reason when I'm at work, but when it's Sundays, I'm at church, that's about faith. Um, but one of the things that Ayn Rand uh, emphasized a lot was that you can't really compromise like that, that once you surrender, you know, an inch of your consciousness to, you know, there, I don't need to be concerned with facts. There's no principled way of drawing a boundary between the two of them. And, and so what you're doing when you, when you, rely on faith when you believe things without evidence or on somebody else's authority is you're saying I'm not competent to figure out the truth for myself and that's that's chipping away at your self-esteem um, I think that one's really important to emphasize um, let me see about other questions there by, one person is asking, are these webinars going to be available for replay? Uh, Colleen asked that, and the answer is yes. And in fact, you could, you'll be able to replay them right away on Facebook. This is streaming live on the Ayn Rand Institute's Facebook page, and the recording will be archived there, and it'll eventually be put up on YouTube. Um, can you give... Uh, you mentioned before when you were talking about... Um, people who have a kind of a, a fake sense of self-esteem. Um, and Jose asked, can you give a real world example in which you saw somebody exhibiting fake self-esteem and how you knew they were faking it? What gives the fakeness away? Okay. Uh, so I knew somebody who, um, they were pretty smart and um, they had some really strong skills in various things, but it was clear that um, there was a, an overemphasis in celebrating their own achievements. Now, I think it's a good thing to celebrate your achievements and don't be shy about, yeah, I did this, this is a great thing. And th there's, no, there's no prohibition on, on being proud of what you do. Quite to the contrary, it's important to, to value your achievements. But there was a kind of um, unnatural um, emphasis on it and it, it got to the point where you would say this person is bragging and the the depth of the, the so the the um their insistence on you hearing how much and in what detail they had accomplished this or that thing um it, it, at a certain point i realized this was a pattern in their behavior and my conclusion was if if they were really that comfortable with themselves why would they need to just take up so much of my time doing this? Um, so there's a couple of people, I, I mean, one person I knew um, visiting this person's house and he was, <laughs> he wanted to show me around. So he showed me his house and um, he, he, for his office, he had to wear suits. And so he went through every suit in his closet and who made it and what brand. And I thought, okay, well, so I get that you're, you're into clothes. And then at some point it wasn't just he's into clothes. It's, I should be sensitive to the brands and brands I never heard about. I'm not interested. I'm not that interested in, in clothing. And it's and with the implication of, Oh, you should get that this is expensive. And because it's expensive, you should get that I'm making a lot of money and my making a lot of money should impress you. And, and the more I was passive sort of non-reactive to it, the more it was kind of goading him on. Just like, and I also have gold ingots in my <laughs> And at some point I thought, okay, there's something not quite right in what you're doing. Now uh, I should say that this is me interpreting someone's behavior. I can't, I, I can't access their subconscious and their, their mind and tell you, but based on this evidence, this level of um, exaggerated, sort of exaggerated, self-involved kind of bragging um, to me was evidence that it was coming from a place of insecurity about their, conf their, their worth and their self-confidence. I suspect that if I were to show you my closet, Elon, I wouldn't succeed in the same way that that person was trying to. I think it was weird that he was doing it in the first place. It was like, <laughs> I need to prove that I have really expensive clothes. So. Well, we have about uh, six minutes left, so uh, maybe it would be best to end on a positive. So here are two related questions uh, that, uh, I mean, you could really go for either of these, but um, one is just, 
what are some examples, this is from Trevor, what are some examples of true healthy self-esteem? And related to that from Jesse, can you take a moment to discuss how Howard Rourke and John Galt uh, addressed self-esteem both similarly and by contrast? So what, what can you say about how Galt or Rourke in Ayn Rand's novels exhibited uh, uh, this, this kind of concept? Um, I guess maybe I'll try to run the two questions together because um, if you want to sort of stylized examples of people with self-esteem and stylized just means boiled down to the essentials that you can see. And this is something anyone can go and find out if they read the book. I would say that Howard Rourke and, and John Galt, if, you, if you're familiar with them, I think they do exhibit self-esteem. And it's, it's interesting to read and understand their characters from that perspective. Um, so one, if you've read The Fountainhead, you know that the story revolves around Howard Rourke being true to his vision of what architecture is about and his integrity to his artistic vision. Now, notice he, he comes to his own views. He, he, um, he has reasons for his views. And he's confident that, OK, um, I'm going to find people who will let me make the kind of buildings I want. I'm not going to pander to people to do things I don't agree with. And so he has this judgment that I can find those kinds of people. And there should be enough. And I, I'll make a living doing it that way. And if I can't do it, then that's not what I want to do. But he's really committed to that vision. And he has the confidence that, look, okay, it doesn't matter that I got fired. It doesn't matter that I got kicked out of uh, college. I know that I can do what I want to do. I'll learn the things I need to learn. And I'm, I, I'm not waiting for someone to praise me. And I wouldn't, that would be nice, but that's not what he lives for. Um, and he, notice how is so the comparison. He, he's not at all uh, concerned that, you know, in the beginning of the book, he and he's a, um, in the same school as his friend, um, Peter Keating and Peter Keating is getting offers left and right for jobs, for scholarships, for doing all kinds of things. And it doesn't phase Howard Rock. It's not what he lives for. It's not what gives him a sense of uh, self-confidence that, oh, if only I got the offers that Peter Keating got, had, that would be great. Oh, I don't have those. Maybe I, I'm not that good a person. That's not at all the way he thinks, whereas that, that's much more the way that Peter Keating thinks. Um, and I think one other aspect I would say is that um, so the one salient characteristic of Rourke is he uses his mind. I mean, he's really focused on understanding the world firsthand. I mean, that's part of the, the message of the book. He's looking at the world himself, not through other people's views. He, he's really trying to figure it out. And that's the part that I think is really crucial to, am I capable? Am I using my mind to the fullest? And I think it is evidence throughout the book that he is. He's learning things. He's figuring out, oh, I made a mistake with this house. Or... I didn't really understand this person, or now I understand this premise about different people and how they behave. And so he's constantly learning and really trying to engage with what he needs to do and to, to navigate his life and career. So that I've said a lot about Rourke. I think we're running low on time, so I'm not going to try to cover um, John Gold's well, but did you want to add anything to that, Ben? Yeah, just that I think you can often, you can often judge uh, someone's self-esteem by, by looking at how do they deal with uh, adversity and do they... Do they fall apart? Do they have a tantrum, or do they do they roll with it? And you know, Rourke is an interesting example. And I don't think it's a spoiler to mention the very first scene in the book, where he's just been expelled from college, uh, but the first thing he does is laugh, and he's standing on a cliff and he's looking at the you know the the rocks that he knows he can he can cut into a building. Uh, which is what he really cares about and not so much about um, what his authority figures have told him to do. Uh, I think all the questions that are left are fairly uh, complicated ones. And so I don't think we're going to be able to get to any more of them today, but Let thank you everyone for submitting them. Yeah, thank you. And, and, uh, and I wish we had more time for questions. It's wonderful that you had so many questions. It's encouraging. Uh, we actually look at them after the webinars and we look at them for ideas, for new topics, for discussion. So it, even if your question wasn't answered today, there's a chance we'll, we'll either answer it another time or turn it into a webinar. And that reminds me, I want to close by encouraging you all to come back next week. Um, ben, who is right here, he will be leading the webinar. And the topic is, can you take credit for who you are? Uh, which is a very big philosophical question. I hope you'll, you'll come and join us. And if you didn't ask a question today, but you want us to deal with another question. So we'd love to get your feedback 
um, send it to us. You can email webinars at einrand.org. Uh, thank you for joining us today. It's been fun. I enjoyed your questions. I hope you found it valuable. Thanks, Yvonne. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.